So um, I'm pleased to welcome you to the final panel. Um, I'm not going to provide elaborate uh, biographies of these people because their accomplishments are so numerous and glittering that it would take uh, the rest of the panel for me just to <laughs> list them. Uh, you know who they are. Thank you very um, much. The way it's well, going to work is we're going to have um, each person speak conference um, the just in the order that the is feast. listed. Um, uh, on the panel I guess for my 10 minutes, and then to try we'll have a little bit of an exchange, some, and then uh, we will put open some of the papers into perspective. And, and and so let's what start do is to, uh, with part that uh, concentrate on the several papers on opportunity sets. Okay. What I uh, want to do is to actually follow Stephanie's wonderful paper, but of in terms of presenting a framework into which you could put things as you saw fit. And given that there are so many philosophers here, uh, that will be a, a wide range of uh, views. I'm not taking any particular view, but it's offering you a particular a, uh, framework, which is <coughs> to see opportunity sets to f give uh, quanti quantified, uh, uh, quantified opportunity sets in terms of the outcomes. So it's going to be the reverse kind of a, a procedure. <coughs> The theory itself, or the framework I'll be offering, includes opportunity sets as intrinsically desirable. It's not being ruled out. Remember, I did say I was following Stephanie here. So it, and it, you name it, it's here. It's <laughs> in the model. Uh, question is, OK. And as a byproduct, what I want to do is to argue that opportunity sets are best seen as uh, inclusive notion of wealth. And finally, that they therefore, um, John Rawls was entirely correct for thinking of wealth distribution in his theory of justice, for which he has been much criticized, as you know. Okay? Uh, so it requires some theorems, but anyway, what do I mean by wealth? I mean the productive base of an economy. Produced capital, human capital, population, knowledge and skills, and health, uh, natural capital, ecosystems, subsoil, resources. Um, Enabling assets, it's a somewhat arbitrary, this classification. And the, the way it works depends on what kind of data you have. And we have put, uh, there have been attempts at quantifying wealth in the published literature. Uh, enabling assets, I'm calling institution, social capital, and time for reasons I won't go into. Um, one way of viewing it is that these assets we, today, of course, we think of anything which is a durable object as a capital asset. So we talk about religious capital, social capital, uh, you name it, it's a capital asset. Uh, they are, if you like, the resource allocation, they help the resource allocation mechanism to, uh, to allocate the capital assets of the first type. Okay, so here's the formal model. I want to think of capital assets are M in number and people are N in number. I and J are the respective. Uh, the set of social states, which by definition are the complete specification of the world from the present to the indefinite future, is capital Y, typical element of capital Y, small y. Now we imagine the kind of uh, two-stage maximization problem I'll be looking at is one which is directed at expected utilitarianism. Again, I'm not committed to it. If you want to do maximin or something, that's fine. But the uncertainty that I'm building in here is through who you're going to be once the veil has been lifted. Okay? So imagine people choose in accordance with the expected utility. Ui of y is j's, uh, uj of y is j's well-being in state y, expected uh, well-being of the representative person in social state y is therefore equation one. That's the expected utility or expected well-being. So the uncertainty is now this is the roles in kind of uh, exercise that's being conducted. Let Kij be the quantity of asset at disposal of person J. And the M, my N matrix of Kij, as I'm going to call this, a bold K. And Y, sub, capital Y subscript J, which is now a function of K, is going to be the set of social states from which J is able to choose once the veil has been lifted. Now this enables me to think of, you know, I mean, I'm following Stephanie very closely here, it leaves open the kind of institutions that prevail after the veil is lifted. It doesn't have to be a well-ordered society. The only thing is well-ordered is the person who is conducting the mental experiment to identify her notion of what constitutes 
a social well-being. Okay? After that, if all hell breaks loose, that will define your capital YJ of K. Notice interactions are allowed in accordance with the papers of yesterday because the entire K, bold K, determines YJ. Okay? So the institutions that prevail afterwards are being modeled here. Now then V, of course, which I'm going to call expected social well-being, is the sum of the YJs at, at, at social state y, small y, yj. Now I define the partial derivative of V with respect to Kij and I call it the shadow price of Kij. And I define inclusive wealth of the economy as the value of all the assets. Notice it's Kij, so it gives you the complete matrix of who gets what, who's entitled to what, once the veil is lifted. <coughs> Let delta denote a small perturbation, then it follows from equations two and four that del V is equal to Pij, del Kij, double summation. Now you can think of, if you wish to, maximize V with respect to the K. Remember, it's a decision problem because everybody has the same view. If they don't, then you go to voting issues, but here I simplify. And it yields the optimal uh, allocation K star. Uh, th therefore, the optimum social state, yj star for each j. Now, the reason you want to go through this route is a standard one. There will be all sorts of events taking place which can't be verified. So the idea of having a contingent uh, contract of what actually will happen is a non-starter if many things are unobservable. So behind the veil, you agree on the allocation of the Ks so that each has an opportunity set over which he chooses, okay? Um, so we all saw the principles of justice as being constructed out of a two-stage decision problem. The first stage takes place behind the veil, and behind the veil all parties subscribe to K star, which is, and I've shown the met method in which you do that. In the long-drawn second stage, each party J pursues his, pursues his optimum life plan, YJ star, having an idea of the resource allocation mechanism that's driving the economy post the lifting of the veil, of course, which is anticipated behind the veil, okay? So each opportunity set, YJ star, has a contingent value expressed in terms of V. Uh, and it's, of course, the, uh, expressed in terms of the shadow prices of capital assets. Now, these shadow prices are, of course, very far removed from market prices, so there's no uh, presumption that when one uses the word wealth, one is restricted. It's a very generic notion, and that seems to be in line with our intuitions. We say that people should have command over capital assets. assets. And how you aggregate the assets will depend on the institutions that you happen to live in because that's how you'll be transforming uh, the, the capital assets into some notion of wealth because it's the institutions which, which will determine the value of these assets in terms of the things you care about. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, I want to think about the connection between preferences and what to want. So I take the basic normative question that we're addressing in light of uh, sophisticated economic knowledge on the part of uh, other people at this conference as uh, what to want and why. Uh, some presentations of ethical theory uh, take this to be a fact of, about the, uh, about the non-natural properties of the world, that seems very strange to me, but I think that the uh, non-naturalists like uh, Tim Scanlon and Derek Parfit and so forth are, uh, say a lot of things that we can interpret as right. If we think of conclusions about uh, what, uh, what's good, what's worth wanting and so forth uh, in this way, that when I come to a conclusion about these things, uh, the conclusion amounts to having a contingency plan for living. So, uh, so I ask what's worth wanting in life under various 
uh, circumstances, and we can think of that as a decision question uh, 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 to be answered with a plan for what to want uh, under various circumstances. And then what we're asking here is what to want uh, for uh, a life of uh, living together in, in community with other people. Now it seems that uh, a person's good, uh, what constitutes the good for a person is very important for this. And, uh, and I found the, uh, say, Valerie's paper on uh, virtue ethics uh, very illuminating uh, uh, in its stress on the role of, of personal projects and a person's good. Uh, I want to make a couple of contrasts, though. Uh, one is uh, it's when I was uh, being exposed to economists a lot. Uh, I haven't had so much contact with economists in recent decades, but, uh, but there was a very strong ethos of anti-paternalism that we have to take a person's good to be a matter of what the person wants. Uh, I think what people want is very important, but we shouldn't identify what a person wants with uh, what a person's good is. Uh, one difference is one that's emphasized by uh, the philosopher uh, uh, R. M. Hare. Uh, there's a one question is what a person does want. Another question is what to want for the case of being that person, uh, and why. And uh, the question of what to want, I say, is one that's to be answered, uh, uh, but that is accepting an answer constitutes uh, coming to a, a plan, and in this case, a plan for what to prefer for the case of being the other person. Uh, we see the contrast in the case of uh, somebody I knew who was a binge alcoholic, so he spent the week uh, very much hoping that he uh, wouldn't get drunk on Saturday night, and then the uh, and then Saturday night he would get drunk and uh, lose his car or something like that. Uh, so it's one question: What will he want on Saturday night? Uh, and unfortunately, he knew the answer: that uh, when Saturday came, he would want to uh, keep on drinking. Uh, it's another question: What to want for the case of it being Saturday night? So on Wednesday. He wants, for the case of its being Saturday night, uh, not to drink. Uh, well, I th uh, what to want for the case of it being Saturday night is much more closely tied with what's uh, good for one on Saturday night than uh, what I will want, although I do want to stress that there's a, a close connection between what people want and what to want for the case of being uh, those people, uh, because people are the uh, are in the best position often to judge uh, what to want for their circumstance. I remember when I was growing up in West Virginia, uh, some people it was a poor area. Some people were living in shacks. My uh, middle class acquaintances would say, "Well, they live in shacks, uh, but there's a television antenna," and this was thought to be a great misallocation. Uh, I think that the uh, people who had a choice between television and whatever they could add to the quality of their housing uh, with the same amount of money probably had a much better idea of how to decide that issue than, than I did or do, and that the importance of uh, being able to uh, uh, participate in the, the arts that you get exposed to by television is greater than uh, than my middle class friends realized. Uh, neither of these, I think, is a person's good. And indeed, a person's good is a difficult notion to interpret. Not everything I, uh, not everything it makes sense to want uh, is something that makes sense to want for one's own sake. So it seemed to me it makes sense to want uh, other people to thrive. It makes sense to want one's friends and family to thrive uh, and also to want uh, people in the world to thrive. That doesn't mean that their thriving is part of one's good, but I, uh, but one thing that uh, seemed to be has become clear in philosophy 
in recent decades is that the notion of a person's good is quite difficult. So are virtues intrinsically part of one's good? Uh, it seems for some purposes, no. If, uh, if I say, well, uh, we'll divide things fairly, you get the virtues, I get the money. Uh, that isn't a matter of uh, uh, sharing out uh, goods in a relevant way. Uh, so uh, virtues include other, uh, other regarding virtues as well as uh, self-regarding virtues. And uh, the, when we're convinced that, the, uh, that both kinds of virtues are an important part of uh, what to want in life, there's, uh, we haven't settled the question of whether to count that as part of a person's good. Well, uh, uh, Tim Scanlon has attacked the notion of a person's good and argued that uh, we place various de uh, demands on this notion that it be uh, what a person is to uh, consult in the case of self-regarding actions, what to consult in the case of benefiting somebody, what to consult for moral purposes, and he doesn't think that there's any one notion that adds up to this. I think that uh, uh, I've thought for a long time that uh, uh, that Harshanyi and Rawls had the approach uh, uh, to ethics right and asking about the original position, which I now learn uh, uh, stems from Vikri. Uh, so uh, Rawls has arguments that are framed as showing that he has an alternative to utilitarianism, but then he rules out uh, rule utilitarianism as what he's talking about just by fiat. And it seemed to me that Tarshanyi was right that uh, uh, Rawls's arguments simply showed that, uh, that if certain conditions held that Rawls was arguing do hold, then uh, uh, rule utilitarianism uh, coincides with Rawls's two principles of justice. Uh, these are uh, conditions like uh, caring very little about what one gets above the maximum level and conditions like that. These make uh, uh, rule utilitarianism and Rawls's theory uh, coincide. So I'm not drawing a contrast between those two theories. I think that they are, uh, I think that they amount to the same thing. Uh, well, uh, so, Harshanyi we can think of as arguing that contractarianism and utilitarianism coincide for the case of full compliance. Uh, contractarianism appeals to reciprocity, uh, basically, and, and uh, if reciprocity uh, isn't forthcoming from others, then, uh, then contractarianism doesn't tell you to do what you would have to do to reciprocate the, uh, the cooperation that others aren't offering. So contractarianism and utilitarianism tell us different things for cases in which uh, we don't have uh, very full cooperation. But uh, Arshanyu is arguing that they coincide for a case of full compliance. Well, Scanlon attacks uh, Arshanyu's way of doing things uh, with his argument that we don't have a, uh, the kind of notion of a person's good that uh, Arshanyu's argument would require. Uh, the only normative ethics I've done in the last few decades, in contrast to early in my career, uh, was uh, a book uh, stemming from Tanner Lectures uh, uh, called Reconciling Our Aims in, uh, in 2008. Uh, so I, I was arguing that we could take Scanlon's uh, criticisms on board and still get uh, what I called a Harshanyi-like argument. Uh, John Broom pointed out that what I was appealing to was not really Harshanyi's theorems, but just the a familiar tangent theorem that, uh, that when you maximize on a convex set, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the slope is given by a tangent. Uh, but uh, uh, what I was arguing was well, the, uh, the social contract uh, presumably allows us to uh, act uh, rationally in some way in light of our 
commitment to the social contract. Uh, we have the classical decision theoretic arguments that uh, acting rationally is equivalent to, act, that is acting rationally in the, in the face of uncertainty is equivalent to, uh, to, uh, to maximizing the expected value of some uh, quantity. Uh, that is, if I act rationally, then there's some quantity that I'm, uh, in effect, uh, maximizing the expected value of it, of, call the scale that gives that uh, the person's goal scale, then a social contract is really going to be uh, uh, an agreement on what to make our goal scales. Now, uh, utilitarianism has become uh, sort of less and less uh, accepted among philosophers. So the general view is that uh, if we make a social contract, what we will contract to do is each have our own goal scale, but somehow accommodate our goal scales to those of other people. This gives a kind of Kantian uh, idea of, uh, of uh, the kingdom of ends, where my ends are, uh, are made compatible with your ends. Uh, but uh, if we have a choice of uh, what social contract to have, uh, one thing about uh, having different goal scales and pursuing them, uh, uh, my pursuing. Just, uh, or, it'd be great if you could okay. Finish up okay. Because okay. Yes. Uh, my pursuing mine and you're pursuing yours is going to give rise to prisoner's dilemmas. So I argue that uh, uh, we can accept Scanlon's criticism and still say that. Uh, uh, say that uh, the ideal social contract will have us each having the same goal scales. Uh, however, as I said, the uh, whether contractarianism is going to tell us to stick to that is going to depend on whether we can really expect other people to reciprocate in sticking to that. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. OK, Eric. I'm not going to, uh, to use slides, but I am going to use uh, the blackboard, uh, my, my favorite technology. Uh, so I, I'd first like to, uh, to, to say how much I've uh, enjoyed this conference. It's, um, it's been informative. It's been fun. Uh, thank you, Glenn and Itai, for, for putting it together. Uh, and I debated with myself for a long time what I should do. Uh, in the end, uh, what I've done is something that you might find utterly banal or possibly completely wrong. Uh, but uh, for what it's worth, I'd, I'd like to, uh, we, we've talked at various points about what is the role of philosophers, what is the role uh, of economists in public policy, I, I'd like to uh, outline a scheme in which uh, philosophers and economists' roles become clear. The, so this is meant to be a positive scheme. That is what I, I hope I'm describing as something close to the way it actually works, uh, but you may disagree. And, and what, what I'm doing uh, is heavily influenced uh, by uh, a book that probably all of you are familiar with. It's uh, Arrow's uh, Social Choice and Individual Values. And it's also uh, influenced by uh, by the mechanism design literature, which I've, which I've spent a lot of my career on. Uh, so I, I'm going to give you a sort of timeline. Uh, philosophers get in there first. So, so <laughs> at, at date one, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> It's the philosophers who uh, discuss what our values should be. And, and some of them will argue for utilitarianism, perhaps. Some of them will uh, argue for uh, 
contractarianism, Rawlsianism, communitarianism. Some, they're not going to agree, but, <laughs> but uh, there will be some compelling arguments. And these are important because uh, influenced by what the philosophers say, members of society at some points decide for themselves what their indivi individual values are. And, 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 and here I come back to Arrow's book. Uh, it's important that the title was Social Choice and Individual Values, not Social Choice and Individual Preferences. Arrow was cons recognized the fact that we don't just think about ourselves, particularly when we're in the political world. We think about society, and, and those are our values, and, and, that's, and philosophers influence those values. So in the second step, so, so th this is value debate at the first step. At the second step, uh, individuals, members of society who, who have individual values come together and they, and they uh, choose a constitution. A constitution, uh, th this may happen all at once. That, that, that happened in the American case. It may be an evolutionary process as in the British case. Uh, but uh, what a constitution does is to lay out the rules for which, uh, w w which determine uh, which political actors get to do what. Uh, you know, what, uh, what Congress gets to do, what Congress does not get to do. Uh, uh, that it, it's a framework for political action. It's what uh, we in economics call a mechanism or a game form. Uh, and it's fair to say that, in, that when the American Constitution was, was chosen, it, uh, the, the the, the rules were heavily influenced by f philosophers such as Hobbes and Locke and Mill and Montesquieu and Rousseau and so on. So, so ph philosophers had a, had a big role. <clears throat> and then after the Constitution is chosen, then there will be a sequence of uh, policy questions that arise. Oh, before, <clears throat> before I get into policy, let me say that there is a role for economists right here, which is uh, how do you design the mechanism? So, so, so individuals have values. Uh, they may be different values, so they will have to make some sort of compromise. Uh, in a sense, the, 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 the compromise needed to reach um, a constitution may not be that difficult to achieve. It, it's, it's not as though people here are behind the veil of ignorance, but uh, they are deciding uh, what the rules are for the future. They don't know what policy questions will come up in the future, and so they may not have particular axes to grind insofar as future decision making uh, is concerned, th th that gives us hope that, that a compromise is achievable, even though the, the constitutional framers may have, uh, uh, may have different values. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, economists can get into the act here because uh, coming up with a set of rules that is likely to achieve particular values is a mechanism design question. <clears throat> and then we have um, the, the policy questions that uh, arise uh, on a, 
on a daily basis. So should we, uh, you know, should we reform the income tax schedule? Should we uh, establish a Medicare system? Should we invade Germany? Uh, should we uh, uh, establish a national park system? In, <clears throat> so in deciding these questions, once again, the, both the philosophers and the uh, economists play a role. The, 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 the philosophers, I, I would say most of the papers in this conference come here. Just, that is, just before the policy questions are decided. The philosophers, once again, go first and they talk about, well, what principles should we think about when deciding policy issues? And then the economists say, well, uh, if, if, if you have these values and if you have these goals you want to achieve, uh, what policies or range of policies might we consider which would, would achieve those goals? So, so this, I think, is most of our conference, but uh, I think that fits into a into a longer timeline. And perhaps you accept this scheme, perhaps you think it's obvious, uh, perhaps you think it's all wrong. We can talk about it later. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Well, first, um, on, uh, really on behalf of our university, I want to express my very warm admiration and thanks to Glenn for the great idea of organizing this conference and to Itai for his extremely uh, central role. And just to say, I think this should be either an annual or every two years event here because each of these themes is a theme for all conference and we really need to talk together a lot more regularly. Well, I'm just going to talk about two issues that are alluded to in some of the papers but not really confronted head on, which I think should be, um, should be integrated more fully. And one I'll just mention very briefly, and the other I'll say a little more about. And the first one is the relationship between norms and emotions. Emotions are, of course, very important for normative ethics. And I would argue also for welfare economics. They, of course, motivate us to move toward our goals, and we need to understand which ones help and which ones impede social welfare. But also, more directly, emotions contain appraisals of value, pictures of what the goal is. And sometimes these pictures do have direct significance for what welfare economics should include. Amartya Sen's famous article, Rational Fools, already pointed out that standard pictures of economic rationality fail to include sympathy and commitment and the altruistic norms contained therein. But by now, psychologists have done a lot more important work on the nature of sympathy, and they've actually opened up areas of tension between sympathy and commitment to principle. And so I think all of this should be, it should be integrated into what we say. And of course, Alan Gibbard has done very important work in, in, in this area. So, so that, too, should be incorporated. Another economist who understood, I think, the importance of this issue was John Harsanyi, who famously argued that sadistic and malicious preferences should not be included in the social choice function. Now, um, I myself, I, I take myself to be following Harsanyi's lead when I've recommended that public reactions based upon disgust, even though they don't see themselves as sadistic and malicious, but if you look more deeply, I think, think they are, they should not be used as reasons for making consensual practices illegal. But of course, getting to that conclusion really does require spending time on the details of the moral psychology. Right now, I'm working on anger and retributive preferences and the role of those in public choice. So, so I think there's a lot. There's a whole research program, and it's very closely connected to our purposes. But now, the, the, more, um, the one I want to really dwell on a little bit more is the choice between what Rawls and Charles Larmor call political liberalism and what Joseph Raz and others have called perfectionist or comprehensive liberalism. So what is the problem? In essence, it's this. In any modern society, citizens have many different visions of the meaning and purpose of life. Some are religious, some are secular. Political principles, the idea is, should recognize and respect that diversity. Now, one way of doing that is to protect ample areas of liberty, 
people should be free to live according to their own ideas of the good, except when the equal rights of others or very important public considerations, such as those of public safety, are at stake. Um, but liberty is just one problem that diversity brings with it. Another one is equality. Because sometimes government tolerates a religion or way of life, but disfavors it, whether by creating unequal conditions of liberty for different groups or by making public statements about what welfare is that, uh, in effect, uh, favor the picture embodied in some group's view and disfavor others. And so this is where the idea of political liberalism kicks in. I think it can usefully be seen as a larger version of the US Constitution's Establishment Clause. That is, we ought not to have any established, comprehensive governmental account of the preferred scheme of values. So we refuse to base political principles on such a comprehensive account because it's bound to be biased in favor of some views of how one should live and against others, and therefore it fails to show equal respect. Now, Larmor and Rawls argue, and I agree, that political principles may still have an ethical content, and indeed they must. The content is not neutral, and it does rule out many conceptions of how one should live that some real people hold, namely all those that fail to show equal respect for all citizens. People remain free to hold and express such views if they don't disrupt others, but the constitution of the nation will commit itself to a contradictory view by, for example, an equal protection clause and, and so on. So these people can't simply bring up their view, let's say, that slavery is a good idea for legislative enactment by majority vote. Albeit moral, though, political principles have to be partial rather than fully comprehensive in order to give citizens plenty of space to pursue their own views and in order to treat them all with equal respect. And I think they have to be partial in two ways. First, they have to be narrow in extent deliberately not covering all matters that human life covers and leaving a lot of space for citizens' comprehensive doctrines to kick in. For example, political doctrines shouldn't pronounce on whether there's a life after death or whether there's reincarnation and so on. And uh, they must also be thin. That is, not basing the political principles on controversial metaphysical or epistemological concepts, such as the concept of the soul or that of self-evident truth, as our framers did, because to employ thick conceptions on which different comprehensive doctrines disagree, when this can be avoided, will bias the political conception in one direction rather than another. Rawls actually calls his method the method of avoidance. Now, my own solution has been to argue for a partial political com consequentialism based on the idea of capability, but uh, I won't go into that now. But the idea is that that way, by focusing on capability, you leave space for someone to choose what to actualize and what not to actualize. A member of the old order Amish can still support the existence of voting rights, although they think it's wrong to use it because it's just the option that's on the table. And I think that way of thinking is congenial to many welfare economists. But then they ought to refrain from proposing a comprehensive doctrine of social welfare and ought to aim only at a partial political doctrine of welfare. Now, none of our papers really confronts or develops arguments on this issue at all. And I think one often senses a general background norm that the right goal for policy would be to come up with a picture of a comprehensive account of welfare. But of course, I'm not saying that the argument is settled in favor of political liberalism. There are plenty of people, including Susan Oaken, John Tassiulas, and so on, who defend ably the more comprehensive version of welfare, which Joseph Raz uh, is the most famous uh, exponent of. But I think the confrontation and the argument is, is what I miss, and I think we need to keep thinking about that. Of course, the freedom discussions, particularly Itai's, do take up a very closely related issue, namely how public policy can promote freedom and what tensions there may be between freedom and other social goals. But notice that this is a related issue and not the same issue. The leading defenders of perfectionist liberalism, that is Joseph Raz and earlier John Stuart Mill, thought of autonomy and freedom as core political values and Raz uses a comprehensive doctrine of autonomy 
to demote and disfavor in public choice comprehensive doctrines, particularly religious ones, that aren't in favor of autonomy. Many comprehensive doctrines, of course, do not promote freedom or autonomy as core values. Instead, for example, they think that meaningful lives should be lived in subservience to authority or community norms. Now, political liberalisms value freedom, too, in a political way. But as with everything else, the political account of freedom will be both narrow and thin. Thin in that there will be no deep metaphysical account of freedom undergirding the defense of political liberty. Narrow in that freedom will not be defended as good across the board, but rather a specific enumerated list of political freedoms will be given a central place in the political conception. And Rawls famously moved from a general defense of the priority of liberty and theory of justice to a defense of enumerated political liberties under the pressure of Herbert Hart's criticism, but also his own evolving thought. Now, I think all of this should be very congenial to Itai because he recognizes that some, but not all, freedoms have intrinsic value. But then the political liberal would want to state carefully that this is a purely political and not a comprehensive account of what is valuable, and that it has a limited political role, not claiming to pronounce on the worthwhileness of the different comprehensive doctrines that citizens reasonably hold. And of course, one wouldn't just use the term intrinsic value to core, but rather one would say that they have intrinsic value for political purposes, and that they can be the object of an overlapping consensus among reasonable citizens. So an Amish citizen, for example, would not grant that the freedom to vote has intrinsic value to core, but they can grant that it has, in a diverse society, a central political value. I think the paper that comes closest to confronting this issue head on is, is that of Valerie Tiberius, who does recognize reasonable pluralism and, and makes that quite central in her argument for her third way. The third way involves support for the formulation and enactment of personal projects. And that's certainly very close to what a political liberal would favor. But I think then there would need to be more explicitness about the distinction between the political conception and citizens' diverse, reasonable, comprehensive doctrines, and an account given of how specifically political values support a reasonable plurality of such doctrines. Probably, too, the term comprehensive doctrine that Rawls and Larmore and I use is a little bit more inclusive than her term personal projects because of course many religions deny that people should be pursuing personal projects and they think it should be communal projects or whatever. So her idea, you know, that the flavor of that term is a little bit too close to the perfectionism of Rawls and Mill. But anyway, I think that's a, an important debate and we ought to uh, carry it on. So I want to just thank you all for such great papers. Right, so at this point, um, I wanted to give all of you an option to uh, respond to the comments you've made, or if you prefer, you know, you can take a pass and we can open up uh, to, for questions. But uh, before we do that, uh, so if, if Partha, do you have any comments you'd like to make? I, I, you'd like to wait? Yeah. Okay, Alan? Yeah, I'll wait. I just want to amplify, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I just want to amplify on something I said before because I realize I, I didn't lay out the scheme completely fully. So, so you might ask, why, why do we need a constitution at all? Why can't we go direct from the value debate to the policy? Uh, decisions that we face. And, and the, the, the reason is uh, that, that people may disagree. So, so I, was, I was arguing that at the constitutional stage, there, there might be uh, a fair degree of unanimity because we don't yet know what the policies that we're going to face will be. So, so uh, if, if philosophers have done their job, uh, we can, th th there'll be some uh, uh, values that we hold in common, and the Constitution will em embody those. <clears throat> but once uh, concrete policies are on the table, then uh, we, our, our own personal interests may come to the fore, and uh, disagreement is likely to be intense, uh, 
And we need a mechanism for resolving that disagreement. That is, even if there is disagreement, we, we need to come to some conclusion. And the Constitution provides the rules for coming to that conclusion. So that, that's my amplification. I just want to comment on Eric's picture, which I, I basically like very much. But I want to, historically, the role of philosophers has never really been so simple uh, because people always had their views and they were influenced by tradition, by religion, and so on. And then the philosophers are typically, and this is true not only in Greece and Rome, but also in um, India and in, um, I don't know so much about African philosophy, but certainly in Chinese philosophy too. They're counterculture and they're critical and they're often very unpopular and they get put to death, et cetera. Um, and uh, you know, so your, your view sounds to me very 19th century in the sense that there was a time. There was a time with all, oh, oh, 18th century. Well, no I, no, I mean specifically 19th, because with Auguste Comte and John Stuart Mill, who were close collaborators, really, you got the picture that traditional religion would wither away, and it would be replaced by an academy of philosophers who would thrash out these questions and tell people what, what to believe, and the religions would just kind of drop away of their own weight. And Comte, of course, did a, a very detailed picture of a council of philosophers who would, of course, meet in Paris, and they would contain representatives from all the world's nations, and so in different proportions, of course, as to whether he liked that nation or not. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it didn't happen. And under, I mean, as Rawls says, under conditions of freedom, people cling to different religious views, and there's no particular reason to think that they're worse people for that. So what does it mean to show respect to them? And, and so now the philosopher, has a dilemma. How much can you pronounce on? And that's why I would defend this kind of thin and narrow core rather than a comprehensive doctrine. I think one, one thing we ought to recognize in economist work is the fact that there are economic problems and there are economic problems and there are economic problems. Not every problem is of a momentous type. It could be whether to build a road uh, or expand a road, a motorway. And the tools that you need to Give it reasoned, uh, create, have it created a reasoned discourse on that fact. People who have very strong views, especially if they happen to have homes next to the place where you're building the road. But the tools that you need will be far more restricted than the tools you need to ask about ideal income tax, or, or a wealth tax, or immigration <laughs> policy, and so forth, and many other things. Because the, the, in the case of the road, it may not be a very stupid thing to look for preferences or try to tease out from people's behavior uh, what the costs are for them to, uh, in, or the, the benefits are, and so forth. So one, one thing I think we philosophers um, perhaps on occasion misunderstand the motives, uh, the, the way we do our work, is that not all problems are of a momentous kind, but they matter. They matter hugely to local people. And if there are lots and lots of these small problems, then to the totality is pretty large. Now, of course, in the process of doing that, you can make all sorts of mistakes, philosophical blunders, you can be crude uh, welfareists and so forth, goes without saying. But the extent to which welfareism, to use that expression, or want regarding, is misleading, does depend on the problem. Well, I, I think that uh, my way of thinking about uh, preferences uh, fits in with a lot of uh, uh, economic practice uh, uh, properly interpreted. So I was drawing a contrast between what people's preferences are and what preferences to have for the case of being that person and saying that uh, what preferences people do have is uh, often the best indication we have of, uh, of what preferences to have for the case of being that person. Uh, and uh, we can agree or disagree about uh, what preferences to have for the case of being you who have uh, such and such a religious uh, belief or something like that. Uh, but then we have the question of uh, control where we don't agree about uh, what preferences to have for the case of being me or for the case of being you, uh, who's, uh, sort of how is the uh, disagreement going to be handled, uh, eventuating and policy. So I, I would think that uh, uh, for the first question, we want uh, 
if the preferences to have are settled, uh, then we want to use the preferences to have for the case of being each person uh, in the way that economists standardly use the preferences that people do have when uh, actually there's often no answer uh, exactly to what preferences people do have or the preferences are not, uh, uh, don't meet standards of rationality and so forth. Uh, I, so what I call for is, uh, is doing what economists do but uh, conceiving somewhat differently what the uh, uh, preference inputs to that uh, are. Did you want to respond? Well, I, uh, let, let me just say one thing. I, I, I was particularly concerned with the economists' role here. Economists giving advice in a, in a society with a constitution, ultimately the public is going to decide. And so ultimately it will be the, the the, the public's values or the individuals uh, constituting that public who decide. The economist is, uh, is, is just the engineer. The economist says, you know, if these are your values, this is, uh, uh, this is, this is how to do it or this is what you no. get. Or, uh, or, I, I don't see the economists as espousing particular values themselves. Yeah. Or, or I would think if these are the values to have. <laughs> I think the question of whether a person's preferences are definitive of the person's good is a different question from paternalism. Yeah. Often we put yeah. the question of paternalism as whether people should be free to make their own mistakes. Uh, but uh, if a mistake about uh, what's uh, good for you uh, isn't possible, if uh, what's good for you is uh, entirely a matter of what your preferences are. Uh, so I would think uh, paternalism uh, allows that uh, a person's preferences uh, may not be for, for that person's good, and, uh, but nevertheless the, the political system should uh, let the person uh, follow that person's judgment. Well, I, I, I certainly uh Agree with you that that, uh, that this conce this conception is heavily influenced by a particular uh, historical experience, the the, the uh, American experience. But uh, uh, I'm not sure. I, I uh, ju just to slightly take issue with what you said. I, uh, I don't think I use the word uh, unanimity at the constitutional stage. I, uh, I did argue that there would be uh, a, a greater degree of agreement at that stage than at the policy stage simply because it's sort of like a veil of ignorance moment where you don't yet know uh, what what policies your, your country is going to be considering. But there, there is still lots of room for disagreement. And in fact, we, we, we know uh, from American history that there was lots of disagreement at the Constitutional Convention. And there were some important compromises, the Connecticut Compromise, uh, which reconciled very different views. Uh, Also, I, I mean, I, I, not all constitutions are hammered out at one particular moment, as the American Constitution was. Uh, often, uh, uh, the rules uh, uh, are the result of some evolutionary process, uh, in, in, in which case, uh, it's hard to say what degree of, of agreement there, uh, there was when a particular rule came, came into play. It may, it, it may be that at, you know, at, the, at the 
th think of what happened in, in, in Britain when, uh, when King John was uh, forced to sign uh, Magna Carta. Uh, it just happened to be a, a time when the, the balance of powers was in the, uh, it, it, in the was not entirely in the king's hands. Uh, and, and, and so we, uh, some rules were introduced because of the particular distri distribution of power at that time. Uh, uh, so this, this scheme is not, is not value neutral. Uh, uh, and, and was heavily influenced by uh, a particular history, but uh, liberally interpreted, I think it, it actually fits uh, many other historical trajectories as well. So the question on the right of the panel, and I'm going to continue the discussion. I want to conclude the seminar and thank you very much.